We're recording! Oh, hello! Didn't see you there. Welcome to another one of these chats where we're losing our minds. Yeah, it just keeps on going and it never stops. Um, and yeah, we're continuing our spiral into madness today by talking about taking contact and make it into a performance. It is a performance art. And how do you put the performance into performance art? How do you put the art into performance art? Um, yeah, like going into talking about building your routine and that kind of super basic building blocks if you've never even touched this stuff before. How do you go about taking all this practice and this love that you're doing and turning it into something solid and real that you want to put out there? Talk about some of the reasons why you'd want to do that, how you can do that, the different kind of forums. Um, and then once you've got this routine, this show, what do you do with it? Do you put it out there for sale? Do you put it out there for love? Do you put it onto the street as busking? Do you get onto a stage to make your grand artistic statement or just to show off the cool stuff that you're doing? Um, and we've got interesting people to talk about this um, who have been doing lots and lots of performance with contact in particular and can hopefully throw stuff your way. Um, people will probably be joining us a bit later on, but. Um, if you've got any questions about this, jump in. People who are here, if you've got points to make, jump in. Um, and if anyone's watching this later on um, and wants kind of feedback on this, because I know this is the kind of maybe the next scary step for people is to make a performance, make a routine. Uh, you can feel free to get in contact with us at ballcontact.org and we can give information to you. So with all that said, with all that said, with all that said, I think, is it fair to say that Everyone in kind of the room at the moment has been involved with performance in in pretty big ways. Yeah, Yay. I think that's fair to say. Yeah. Um, um, can I just compliment you first on uh, your new COVID haircut? Uh, I got one too. Oh, uh, mine's really bad. I, I, I'm gonna. This is. I missed a spot at the back. Oh no! I've been too lazy to redo it. <laughs> But then um, I'm not going bangs, anywhere. I actually cut the bangs underneath uh, way so short. Um, and I'm so happy there's a layer. <laughs> I don't know. This is, uh, yeah, this is the nice protective bubble means that nobody notices. <laughs> <laughs> no um, but yeah, so as I kind of like to do in these scenarios is kind of throw around the room a little bit and then we, we kind of dive into our topic. And... I'm wondering, from the people who are, have had experiences here, one of my favorite things about performances is just how you end up in the weirdest situations. So if you've got an idea of like what has been your like standout either positive memory of like this is an amazing place I get to be to perform or the weirdest place you've ever been to perform or like the weird, like the sketchiest worst place. Um, I can go first, but does anyone have any... Uh, the Any... weirdest place I've ever performed is Edinburgh. <laughs> it is a fucking madness. But it's such a... <laughs> it's such a, a unique chance that... I mean, it's kind of, hey, people arriving. Um, yeah, that strange mix during August of so many people who just want to be entertained. They're just there going like, go on then. Show yeah. me what you've got. And is... then you can also have some guy with a sword and a kilt like screaming through your show or somebody singing and dancing or you just showed up by that like five, oh no, that seven ball juggler who's swallowing a sword right next to you. Luther. Uh, <laughs> it's just- Luther it's... only does five while juggling. Oh, while he's swallowing okay. He doesn't do seven, okay? <laughs> I mean... Anyway. It's, it's just madness, but yeah, I know. It, uh, performing can bring you into crazy situations. So. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll piggyback off that because mine's Edinburgh specific as well. Right up at the top, Edinburgh, like old towns built on a hill and there's a castle at the top there. Um, just underneath that, there's this really lovely restaurant, which is like Michelin star, incredibly fancy. Um, I got invited to do walk around for a tiny little wedding that was going on there. It was going on on Halloween. And the bride and the groom both worked in the horror film industry, like the British horror film industry. So it was the most extravagant, horrific, like masquerade, kind of special effects and all this kind of thing. Um, and it was wonderful. Through like 20 minutes of walk around in this clearly haunted old building that I got to go around all the kind of, because it used to be like a hotel kind of thing as well. So there's all these little 
nooks and crannies that you could go in and it's like I definitely would never get a chance to be here but this is incredible and then yeah all just the warmth of this tiny little wedding but everyone in these strange cult kind of Lovecraftian masks and things yeah that was uh, I think possibly the weirdest one for me yeah wow it's really amazing right and I don't know it just the, the the various situations that you can get into and all the masquerades and and um things but it really brings up this question of like what is performance and like does it mean anybody looking at you is is uh is what we're doing today here i mean i call this a seminar i don't call this performance and but what's the difference i still put on my makeup and i'm all like prepped and ready to go um you know, like uh, there is a lot of parallels between something like teaching and performing, but there's something special about putting on all of the makeup and getting into costume and getting into character and, and doing that. So Blake, um, you teach performance, right? Yes, but yeah. not, uh, not with juggling technique. I, I don't really teach juggling. Right. Uh, because I tell my students that they can do that on their own time. <laughs> <laughs> like, you, like you need to but I teach ensemble performance physical theater technique and uh, devised theater and what do you tell your students like is there a definition of performance that you would tell well, them? I think it was, I mean yeah ev everybody's that sense of expectation everybody's looking at you uh, and the necessity of a kind of designated space for that even if those people know they're coming to a party, there's gonna be performers at this party, they're coming to a street performance or a place where a street performance happens like Edinburgh, or they're coming to specifically to a stage show. You know, there, there needs to be a, for me, a designated space, at least even if that's only a two foot bubble around you and a certain heightened level of presence, which draws focus, <laughs> you know, to say like, I don't think I need to give my students an entire definition of what performance is because they luckily have a clearly defined space in the theater where those things are going to happen. That's not always the case for us working on the street or working uh, in an event as a roving performer where people have other priorities than sitting in a chair and shutting up and watching what you're doing. I think that's worth diving into that. Um maybe early doors drawing our distinctions of as contact performers in particular, what are our options for types of performance? And we talked about this, like you've got your, your street, you've got your stage, but how can we kind of break that down into different categories? Because there's so much uh, nuance in these. Yeah, I mean, it, and I think I wrote in the notes there that for me in terms of event performance or any kind of contact performance, you wanna be as aware as you can possibly be of what the situation is going to be and what's expected from you in that situation. You know, the performance that I would do on the mile in Edinburgh is miles away from a performance that I would do as an ambient performer in an event. It's taking way too much focus. As Don was saying, like the mile, you're in a constant battle to maintain your performance space and maintain focus when you're doing walk around, you want to take a little bit less attention. You don't want to be the center of attention. You want to be more intimate, more directly present with a people sitting at a table. You know, I've done a lot of events where people are seated at different tables in the dining room and you're kind of doing 20 mini shows for each little table as you come around. Or you're on a stage where people are, you know, you're, there's a unified focus of the audience and they're saying you've got seven minutes, 10 minutes, and we're all gonna be looking at you, you know, th that requires a different set of considerations because you don't have to work quite so hard as you would in Edinburgh to maintain attention, but they have a certain expectation of a technical level of performance. If you're up there on the stage, they wanna see you do something cool. So it, I think I, I've just, the ball is always the same, but who you are around the ball and through the ball to the audience has to change enormously and maybe sometimes change from moment to moment within a performance or within an event. And trying to be sensitive to what the audience wants or needs or what your clients want or need and how you can make those kinds of adjustments and what you need to be safe and not drop the ball on someone's face, which is what really worries me sometimes in the situations that you end up in in performance where, you know, this is a dangerous object 
And if, if that thing, and it's never, it, it happened to me in ways that wasn't so bad, but I've definitely had it in my nightmares many times of like, this thing is gonna go somewhere where I can't control it. And then all the magic and all the love and all the everything and all <laughs> is gone. I got a weird story for you. Oh my God, this happened just before uh, we all got locked down. I was invited to a um, marijuana opening party for a new cannabis store in Canada here. Uh, Tommy Chung was there. It was such a wild party. They were handing out marijuana and I was like, wow, this is incredible. But I ended up like, you know, walking around with a ball in my head and everybody's like, wow, because they're wrecked. <laughs> like, I'm the only sober one in the room, but I have a ball in my head and I'm doing my dance. And then some lady just comes up to me and like, hey, you're my best friend around my neck. And the ball just went smash into her face. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, I can't. Like, what do you even do? You can't control that situation, but it's not something that I could have foreseen. I mean, I know that they're not totally with it, but what are you going to do? And we apologized profusely, and she agreed that it was her fault, but <laughs> it was, like, not okay. And I don't know. It, you know, these situations um, should be considered, and, you know, I have insurance for that. In, 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 in those cases, you do have to make sure that you cover your butt, uh, these things can happen. They can hurt people. In this case, it didn't hurt her. It was embarrassing. Um, and that's the worst that seemed to happen. But I, I want to jump in with a, a stolen story of someone else who um, should probably best rem remain nameless in this scenario. I'll say that they're not someone in this room, so I'm going to steal the story though. Um, of them performing at a, a Steiner school for the kids there. And apparently, like a lot of the kids, kind of quite hippy dippy backgrounds, sort of a little bit space cadet kind of kids, um, managed to at one point in the routine drop the ball so that it whacked into one of these children, like full on, not from a stage, like it was all on ground level. Um, and a child just looked up at them after being completely thwacked with a big smile on their face saying, I've been blessed by a crystal. And nothing else was said. <laughs> oh, wow. And yeah, oh, Blake, that stands muted. out. Is ask to unmute. Um, you're muted, Blake. Uh, ask to unmute. Um, here we call them a Waldorf school, but I, I worked for one here in New York as a circus arts teacher, and they asked me to do a perform a walk around performance for their end of your picnic in a big park called Prospect Park in Brooklyn. And it was a similar thing where these kids, they kind of some of them knew me, so I didn't have that bubble of personal defense, but I was working in silence and contact juggling and doing some toss juggling. And literally I had eight to 10 children just hanging off of my limbs. I mean, I was carrying them, dragging them. They were trying to grab the ball coming out, you know, and I'm still trying to make my way around. And the parents are all just like sipping cocktails. <laughs> You're like, oh, it's so like I, one, I will drop a ball on your child too i might intentionally drop a ball on your child if they don't stop hanging off of my limbs while i'm trying to work and i literally had to like drop out of the event for a while and be like i need a break i'm going to attack a child and oh man that was hell i never went back and worked there and the late they oh the kids loved you the afterwards i get the email they loved you they loved you <laughs> oh god <laughs> How Those do you know boundaries, are... right? That's a huge deal. And, I, and, and um, I have a whole theory that I was writing out for a little while about um, a little red rope in like how much a little red rope can um, make a boundary between people and, and how much actually the people who are dangerous to me on the street as a woman are the people who cross that rope without asking. And it's really interesting because there's such like, you know, the families, all of the, the children there always know, like, that's a red rope that you don't cross. And the, the only people who do it are like, kind of guys who want to come up and take a picture and, you know, get in these like sleazy ways with for things in my ears. And it's like, I know that they're not going to be safe and that I should be very protective if they cross that line. And it's, it's, it doesn't, you don't have to do a lot. In your situation, you don't have a line, you know, but, but how do you draw your stage? How do you draw your boundaries? Where do you create your bubble? And, and, and um, I don't know, do you have any advice? Does anybody know 
I, I just want um, just because in case the conversation jumps on, um, Greg, were you oh. jumping in there? So waiting for you to take a sip of your drink so I can catch you at the worst moment. <laughs> Yeah, I will, on the topic of, of performing, especially performing for children, uh, this was a show that Brian and I saw in 2014 in Humble uh, with Curtis. So there's a, there's a juggling friend of ours here, um, and he wasn't contact juggling, but he's incredible, and he has this really big mustache, and he's kind of a sort of zany, intelligent, um, sort of sarcastic sort of character almost all the time, just really brilliant. And he was doing this dial, uh, Diabolo act, and there are the, all these kids that were up front. There was like 15 of them, 15, 16 of just all these kids of all these different ages, and they were heckling him on stage. And then when one person started to do it, and Curtis ended up uh, talking back, you know, kind of heckling back and forth as he's really good at doing, there was all of these kids ended up joining in and they ended up just counting how many times he was doing a trick over his performance. And what I thought was amazing is that there were no parents that were nearby that stood up to basically say, you know, to shut their kids up. So, so the, uh, Curtis, the performer ended up doing a great job at incorporating all of these heckling, which I think is a brilliant, uh, a brilliant idea, taking heckling these kids, and painting these kids as not very well um, raised and, to, and like kind of bringing their parents in as a joke to help shut these kids up. And it was just absolutely brilliant. I, I, I wish that I could have handled that. And it as worked? It worked. It worked eventually. I think the kids got it before too long that they were being made part of a joke for ev at everybody else's expense, at a gala show. Oh, I've been eaten alive. <laughs> like that's something that's really hard to recover from. Wonderful <laughs> job, yay! That's I don't know like being on the. Oh, sorry, Tom. But if you no, know, no, I mean, uh, yeah, go, go, go. Do you know Nico? He's an American magician. He's been in Edinburgh for the last couple of years. Uh, wears a cowboy hat, throws a ring up in the air, and catches it like a finger ring. Throws it in the air, catches it on his finger. Um, there's a video that just went viral of him telling off a kid who does a backflip during his street show in New Orleans and like breaking character and this kid's disrupting his show and he kind of gives him this whole lecture and it, it went through a lot, you know, it was on TikTok or something. And it's, it, look at the evolution of the response to that video. I think it highlights a lot of what we're talking about and somebody's kids trying to upstage his show, he breaks character, he kind of gets pissed off at the kid, but he's also like, don't do this to other performers because they might get way more pissed off than me. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an interesting video, it's worth a watch. What was his name? His name's Nico. Uh, he's not a juggler. I mean, he, he can juggle some, but he mostly does magic. Um, um, street magic. Lisa, you are weighing in here. I, you have some experience in this. I have, as a full-time primary school teacher, um, I work with kids all the time. Well, not now, but in general, I should. And um, kids are masters. Not, so, not all of them, but some of them. They are a master at verbal dancing. They will bring you where you need to, where they want you to be. And uh, it just fires their brain with, I don't know what, it just gives them everything they need. Like, like you said, that, that on my perspective as a teacher, that performer that lost character and tried to put that kid in his place, lost the kid one over him. And, and like the one Greg said, he the the adult one over the kids and in a beautiful graceful way that's incredibly difficult to manage especially when there's loads of them i don't know why children are so good at it and i don't know why we lose it as we grow up but children are absolutely masters at making you lose your everything i don't know how else to do it not all of them lots loads of kids are amazing but you could have 20 30 kids you only need one or two who have that part in their brain to, uh, to screw up everything. And that's just the thing I want to say. It's like, it's a forever finding ways of how to deal with it. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And it's just trying to figure it out how by knowing what the, the child wants and what does the child want is to make you lose control. 
And and Greg says in the comments here that it's a power struggle, and like I would agree with that um, in in a big way. Um, and and that's something about performance that attracts some of that energy is that like because we're taking attention, we are taking power. We are saying that I have a voice and I have something to say here, and it's worthwhile listening to me. And um, all of that is valid, but people are challenging that power um, a lot in performance, especially on street. The stage itself gives you a platform literally that you have power on and that's kind of a different, and you turn off the lights and there's a specific expectation of, of how your um, audience behaves in that situation too. So you can kind of protect yourself. These are ambient and, and busking problems. Um, the question is though, Tom, is, is, is why why do we put ourselves in that position in which we can be eaten alive by children? Well, yeah, I like it's kind of interesting that this would come out as the first kind of points of this because starting out, it's like why are we? Why would we put a performance together? Um, possibly to make money. Possibly that's your first concern: is well, I'm doing this thing. I'm I'm good at it. People are giving me good reactions. Um, maybe I can make some money from this. Um, it's then that step you go out. I mean, you could maybe try a, a circle show first off, but more likely you're going to be trying some ambience. You're going to be kind of testing the water there. And then you realize, oh, wait, this is more than just, I can't just get up here and do five minutes of tricks. It's not going to do anything. I need to actually think about what a performance is. Or maybe you get an offer to put your stuff on stage and someone says, oh, I'm putting this show together. Do you want to be part of it? Or something like that. Like often, um, like, student productions or something like that and it's like well if i'm putting on stage do i just do three minutes of intensive trick after trick after trick or do i try and build something there um isn't that every juggler's first show like like like, like literally that's why i'm a, a performer because it's like oh well i i just spent five years learning all these tricks i probably should show somebody <laughs> like, it's like that's kind of how i ended up on um the street in in in, in many ways but um, I think it's worth, I would be interested to know what people's um, kind of process is with this. I mean, without getting deeply philosophical, if you like, but um, that actual bare bones, how do you build a routine? You have um, to know your audience. That's the key thing. It's different for every audience. Different states have different audiences, different types of performances have different audiences. That's the key. Okay. So, say for example, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's so true. And it's if you're doing, say, uh, a juggling festival stage, your material is going to be so different to if you're doing like um, a corporate gig or a charity gig or something like that. If you've got a lay audience or an expert audience, there's such different expectations. Um, but I'm mean on a literal, on a technical, basic level, is there a process that we go through when we want to create something new or is it relatively organic of letting it grow is it um so your is question it based around is how do you build your first act like what do you do um like like the sequencing itself were you talking about the character or like i mean well, it depends on your lens right? what yeah exactly what does confess i think this is an interesting thing for people to to weigh in on because for some people i'm sure it's we build like the building blocks are the technique. It's the, the moves themselves. It's I'm going to tell this story in the actual mechanical technique that's going to progress along. Um, which is, yeah, that's one the way of Michael doing it. Michael like, motion, eight, seven, six, five. <laughs> yeah. Like I your mean, context is something like that. Uh, me and Mellers used to have a theory that every contact juggler goes through the Michael motion phase. At some point in time, they end up naked on a stage with eight balls and it just happens. And I don't know how, <laughs> but I didn't even know Michael motion existed or David Bowie existed. And I was doing that. And I just, so it's interesting, right? Because we're jugglers. And so that's sort of the first contact juggling routine. Michael motion did it. And a lot of us go through that process. Yeah, and it's often quite devoid of um, persona as well. Was someone jumping in there? Blake. Blake, go for it. Yeah, for me, it's interesting because I come from a theater background. Like, I studied theater before I started juggling. And I was in theater school when I started juggling. So I always looked at 
the juggling as the technique on which to hang my character, the way that I would go through to the get the audience impressed with something I was doing so that I could also make them laugh or so that I could get keep and hold their attention. And so it was always only like, it was, again, like the ball is a, a prism through which my personality and what I wanted to do, which, you know, maybe connected to my insecurities of like, pay attention to me, I'm cool. <laughs> like I, I wanted to work on the street. I started doing theater on the street. And then I saw where juggling could go and really focused on juggling so I could go on the street and make money and not have a real job. Like, I'm not saying not make money because I, I did want to make money because I didn't want to work in an office or work as a waiter or a bartender anymore or try to audition for theater, which is asking permission. I just wanted to go out and make direct contact with people. And the ball was always such a way to make contact with people, you know, ironically speaking that when that thing comes out, if you can handle it and you've done some work, suddenly people are looking at you, then what do you do when they start to look at you? Do you focus in on the ball and like, I'm gonna do a demonstration of an act or a sequence of tricks that I've made up? But for me on the street, I was never doing a set number of uh, set sequences. I was just always trying to be in contact with the audience and adjust based on what they were giving me. But I feel like that is very inspired from a theater improvisational clown background, uh, which I think some ju I came at a little bit backwards than some jugglers, other jugglers have who came to that kind of performance through juggling. So that's my Do you opinion. find through that kind of stuff that you get um, these kind of comfortable loops? You start to kind of recognize the type of audience that you're getting in that street environment and you know oh if i sequence this stuff together this stuff's gonna hit yeah and i think as i got further along things became more formalized organically in terms of the sequences i was using um but then you know what tricks have i not used yet on this crowd that's here for six minutes when did they get here how long have they been here you know, what have they seen? What have they not seen? What do they like? Do I have a kid that I can choose? You know, you make those adjustments in real time. And then eventually it's a, you know, it's, it's a set of tools or a set of patterns that you know how to fall into. But I didn't spend, most of my act building was actually on the street itself. And that, was that always monetarily, you know, remunerative? No. But over the course of years and time, I think I developed that sensitivity. And then that translates really well to the stage because your energy on the street is so present to hold the performance space around you. Once you get on the stage, you're just like, oh, it's like coasting. <laughs> I think that that pulls out like, yeah, that, that's a huge point, which for people who are maybe new to this, who aren't performing as much, it's something that it's well worth doing. It's like, put this stuff out there. Don't expect to make loads of money the first time you go out, but working this stuff on the street it's so direct because you know if people give that wow moment or if they walk away you know instantly whether you're sequencing whether your routining is working in that moment like it's there is no better way to kind of drill this stuff down and um, you become accustomed to making contact with the audience it's easy to hide behind the ball like you would when you're practicing you know you look right at the ball you you really focus on it but i think i wrote about it in the notes for this conversation is like 50 percent of your focus has to be on the people that you're performing for and what they're seeing what they're feeling what they're experiencing and also letting them know like this is an awesome trick <laughs> yeah like selling your own work giving stuff space to breathe is like a huge huge part of that of yeah. saying actually know what I just did instead of just blasting straight out, giving weight to certain things that will really, uh, will really go. So, sorry, we're just talking about streets. So I've, I've decided just to put some of this on just um, because all of these are, are really relevant. So, you know, getting your tricks together, your sequencing. Goldie is probably the first show I, like my first show I ever did uh, is probably the basis. And that's the thing that I really liked about Blake's conversation. Um, I had a base that I kind of went out. I'm like, I'm going to do these tricks. And then as I saw what worked and what didn't, and this like that blowing trick, I mean, it's so overdone, but it's because that's what gives me eye contact with my audience. And then I can actually bring them together 
um, with those tricks to develop these kinds of circles and, and, and create that um, safe space. And eventually, if, if you can do it well enough, you can get the audience to develop the safe space for you, right? Is that like, a 125 or a 120? This is just a 100 millimeter. I oh, have that's 100. Actually, it looks big. Thanks. The, the one I'm using now is 120. I am using 120 on the street now. Um, I, it is really heavy, but after some weight lifting and you get used to it, it's, uh, yeah, yeah. But, but don't clock yourself in the jaw. Like, oh my God. <laughs> they are not messing around. It's not a good look. No, exactly. So, um, but I, I, I want to just like kind of stress like off what you were saying there. Um, especially if you're coming into it from a purely juggling mentality, showing off this skill. So yes, people are coming to a performance to see the skill, to see something happening, but they're looking at the performer as well. And like human kind of nature to make a connection with people, they want to make a connection with you just as much. For stage work, that's so important because if you've made, if you've established that rapport with an audience, they won't remember drops. They won't remember mistakes. They'll remember the cool stuff that you did because that's going to stay in the head because they make that connection. It's so easy for us to take that step behind and really hide behind the prop. And I've seen jugglers with amazing chops on the street, but with no audience contact and no structure and no look, no character. And they just get blown away. Nobody cares. I mean, five clubs is like, I will never in my life juggle five clubs. And you do five clubs in a pair of gym shorts on the street and 90% of people are gonna walk right past you. And that's a sad reality, but it's just like, okay, or maybe they'll watch you for 10 seconds. So it's, it's a shame, it's, you know? Sebastian, I think is, um, oh, oh, unmute. Oh. We've got a few uh, comments coming up. Yeah. Hello. Uh, is it okay to jump in like this? Yes, please please. do. Please do. Um, so, like, um, I'm from Austria. I'm a performer, and for me, I I kind of see it like when you see like street shows, private events, and corporate events. How they work here is quite interesting because they demand different things from your technique, from the duration of your show, your interaction level, and also your drop rate. Like, for example, we do sometimes big corporate events, and there is a simple rule which is zero drops. So whatever you do, however difficult the situation is, you don't drop because you won't get another job. On a street show or a private thing, it actually drops can help engage people to, to realize that you are really giving your best, which weirdly on a, on a big high class event thing, you, uh, you don't like you, you don't take risks. You cannot because it's forbidden. So that's, that's, I find interesting and also the aspect of, of time so much because mm -hmm. when you have a private event, people want to have the biggest, longest show you can get. Um, event shows sometimes I perform for 42 seconds, that's it. I run on the stage, I try to get past all the other performers, I do my thing on beat and I'm off. And that's really stressful because you get one chance, you know, and uh, on a street show, I feel you can more, yeah, interact, relax a bit and uh, yeah, play with them. Um, I was just going to throw across um, to Savita there. You were um, talking about music in the chat, but um, go ahead. Yeah, I, I was, but I, what I wanted to jump in on was actually what um, people were saying about people te technically very good uh, performers who don't engage with audiences. And I see that so much with magicians, particularly card magicians. They're absolutely brilliant technicians. As a magician, you watch them and you go, that's amazing. But their interaction with the audience is just nil. And then you get somebody else who is an average technician, but they've got, they make that eye contact. They pick out one member of the audience to perform to. They bring that person into the, the performance, even when that person isn't on the stage. And somehow that goes through to the rest of the audience and they just enjoy things so much more. I mean, in piggybacking on that, I think I wrote in the notes as well, it's like the balance between vulnerability and thick skin eye contact with the audience, real connection with the audience requires an actual vulnerability from the performer. 
but you also have to hold strong to what you're trying to do. And avoiding that vulnerability can lead to a closed off regard and not being present with them. So it's a, it's a whole other discipline to be honestly connected with people because that requires the possibility of screwing up what you're doing or looking like a fool, which most people try to avoid in their lives off of the stage. Oh, at, well, even on a stage. I mean, if you walk off a stage looking like a fool, oh goodness, it's a, it's a week. Um, but if I you wanted... let them know you're a fool from the beginning, then you're all set, you're good. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Like if you get the audience, if you bring them in, bring them into your world, that goes so much further with that. I remember Stefan Singh told me he would walk out on stage in a show and just drop intentionally right at the start. Just drop the ball on the ground and look at it pick it up and juggle and then every drop after that the audience thought was artistic license and i was like yeah that's gonna that's gonna cost me a bit much in acrylics but <laughs> you know, i like it theoretically but i think what uh sebastian said earlier about what kind of gig you're at and what is possible and what their expectations are and what level of intimacy the the event has really has to influence what you're doing and the zero drop thing I think I mentioned it earlier, but it's just, you know, you are, you are dead in the water in some of these situations if you drop. I've been juggling in a party which was packed with 200 people and there was a, a Picasso on the wall that's, I don't know, worth $200 million. My ball goes out of control because some drunk person bumps into me and it puts a hole in a Picasso. My life is over. <laughs> Those people are going to run me I mean, just no insurance is going to cover that. So, unless you then become I, incredibly, so yeah, unless you become then, incredibly famous, and then it actually adds value to the Picasso. The man who put a hole in the Picasso. I know that's um, that's what I'm working towards. Lisa, but, yeah, um, just gonna throw throw over sure. to you there, Lisa. Um, what's the thing? Yes, I was thinking. Sorry, I was listening to you, Blake, and I forgot what I wanted to say. Um. Uh, so not necessarily drops, but for me on a stage, um, because I mainly lead on stage and not much of a street, uh, the moments when I have the best connection that I realize and the moment where my best performance are always when I have a weird fumble at the beginning, because when something goes slightly wrong, it makes me laugh. And I'm like, oh, oh my God, I just almost dropped that ball. It went in like complete zigzag and that was terrible. And it made me smile and it kind of break that stress that I walk in at the beginning. And after that, I'm like, well, whatever. And I'm actually having a lot more fun during the performance. And I'm actually connecting so much more with my audience than I would if I didn't have that slight little fumble. But then I mean a fumble, not like dropping the ball on the audience. That would be a sh like, I don't know how I would recover for that. But like, you know, you like, we want to do a thing and then you don't, and you go, uh, 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 okay, and then, then change your plan. So for me, that's, uh, uh, I find that incredibly, weirdly, incredibly important to have that and in, in my performance to show that we're, I don't know, we're human and we're connecting to people and we make mistakes like everybody else. The other thing that Blake made me think about is the only performance I did was definitely not next to a Picasso. <laughs> was uh, next to a wonderful woman who was playing a harp. And I don't know if you know how freaking valuable harps are and delicate. I'm like, there was nobody rose. There was no nobody rose happening when I'm less than a meter and a half away from a wonderful singer with a harp, with a stage who had a stupidly low ceiling for a reason I ignore. Um, yeah, so that's the only moment uh, that I, I was actually felt in the hot water and had to like make decisions of like no the is just safe safe stuff and period isolation it's all isolation, isolation. <laughs> right. you're gonna see me do that for three four minutes because I'm not taking risks with a heart next to me right right no, no, sorry. um I wanted to bring something up kind of cascading between both uh, Lisa and Blake's points and something that I am super passionate about. And actually my favorite class I ever taught, most successful workshop ever taught was on dropping. It was at EJC in 2014, I think. Um, 
And I feel like, yeah, Sebastian's point as well is, is really, really interesting, especially when it comes to American being an American. I think we have a lot more leeway when it comes to sloppiness on stage. Um, more or less, definitely, definitely in the streets as well. But I, I always tell people that dropping, specifically when you have a show, when you have a character, you need to learn how that character drops. Because when you have a show, when you have this magic that you're presenting to people, um, you, a drop breaks that and you lose that connection with them. And you, ha you have to have a way to bring that back. And whether it's, it's humor, like a lot of times if you're doing some, some kind of clown act or, or something humorous, it's really easy to play it off with a laugh. But if you're doing a serious performance with a serious energy, how are you going to bring that back? How are you going to keep people engaged? And one of my favorites of all time was uh, MCP, who was doing this really serious and incredible, of course, you know, contact staff piece. And every time he dropped, would, you know, kind of look at the staff and then go down and just start doing push-ups and then get right back in, get right back into the act. And it would kind of relieve that tension. And, and it's just one of those things, again, if you have an act that you never, ever have never dropped, um, that's fantastic. But I think it's something really worth looking into is, is um, finding out how your character would drop in character and how to save that. It's a bit of a, like, that double-edged sword of contact, especially with acrylic as well, because it's such, the atmosphere that we usually try and put across, especially with an acrylic, is that floatiness, that lightness, that magic of this thing is under my control. And the sound of it hitting the ground and bouncing away is so opposed. It's so the antithesis of all of that, that loud noise, the sudden jerk, and we're so protective of it. I have never recovered. I've never so recovered up. from a crystal ball drop. Just never. Exactly. <laughs> and like, there's things we can do to mitigate. Um, I mean, like, I think the term, the term that we use in clown is virtuosic failure. Can you fail well? That's a great expression. Jane, and, oh, sorry. No, no, no. And, and, and I think, again, from Stefan Singh, and I don't know if it was Remy, Remy Lahoussigny, who talked about it, of the timing of recovery from the drop. The tendency of the juggler is to rush to get the ball, which is an attempt to hide what happened versus allowing the drop to sort of resonate and with your recovery and not trying to conceal it because it cannot be concealed. Yeah, learning a really good kick up goes a long way. And I have like one, it. yeah, one, but sorry, one quick story about Edinburgh and virtuosic failure. I remember it was two years ago, I was just hitting uh, temple rolls with an acrylic on the street. And it was some of the first times that I felt solid enough to do it. And I did it once or the first couple times I was clean on the first try and I was so happy about it. And a photographer, because there's a lot of photographers who float around on the mile. Oh yeah, I loved your act came back the next day and I was trying to do it again and I missed it the first two times. And then, you know, one more time, one more time. And I, yeah, yeah, one more time. And hit it on the third try. And afterwards he comes up to me, oh, it's so good how you work those first two mess ups <laughs> in your head. Roll. Like everyone was just so much more with you when, when we saw you miss it twice. And, we, and I was like, yeah, if only I were good enough to make sure that I hit it on the third time every single time. Like I wish, bro. But of course, what do you say? Yeah, I know. It's, I'm, I'm really glad I worked that in as well. That's all part of the craft. <laughs> Go on, okay, Jane. Jane, yeah. Um, at Circa Media, we had a lot of time to work with Sean Gandini. And he had a lot of really, like, we had an entire drop thing um, during E&M Intensive Week. And so we had whole workshops on like, okay, we'll drop like this. Now drop like this. Try and surprise yourself with a drop in something you normally don't drop. And he used the Circa Media second years usually. Uh, no, maybe first years. Um, as beta testing for ideas he wanted to make. <clears throat> so the year ahead of me was the beta test for Smashed. My year was the beta test for Blotched. Um, and we had 
that year particularly he was uh he wanted to make a show that was dedicated to one particular season of Alexander McQueen. Um, and so he had us like make bondage wear out of trash and then taught us a bunch of, you know, partner site swaps and made these really weird creature things and he picked like the worst juggler in the class and every time somebody dropped we'd hit him with a foam roller it would be like somebody would drop in the pattern and then adam got hit with a foam roller and we'd continue and uh the other one we had was was oh yes so every time you dropped in whatever you were doing you would be like oh yes <laughs> and then pick it back up and keep going. And it made some really interesting material. Uh, and that's the end of my story, shush. No, but it's really important. Um, I mean, I know my Instagram's really rough, but it's actually intentionally, like I drop at the end of each video um, to sort of just for me. So I am learning drops all the time. Greg? Oh, oh that was fast. Yeah. Um, <laughs> On the topic of drops, especially like under pressure, it made me think of a uh, a really surprising moment. You know, I, as I found that learning contact juggling and learning other other skills as well kind of helps develop your subconscious like ninja sometimes, where you just sort of react to something perfectly without really thinking about it until it's done. Like, oh, that. I just recovered from that. Well, well, something like that happened at Pack Fire 2014. With, uh, there was the Renegade show, and it was really disorganized, as a lot of American Renegade shows are. Um, and I had been waiting to go up to perform for like 25 minutes, just kind of waiting in line. And then they started calling out people in the audience, and I was a little too shy to kind of jump in. And so when I finally was able to, uh, another person was called from the audience and it was actually Drex, the point spinner. Someone had called him up and then I got invited up at the same time. And so we're like, oh, well, who's going to go first? And then somebody yelled, battle. So now I'm here battling Drex, which was super intimidating. And we went through this, it was like a, a sequence back and forth three times and I progressed. I started with one 90 millimeter and went all the way up to three to do like a multiball sequence. And uh, while I was at three, I dropped. And the floor of the lodge is all, it's all concrete, it's hard. So I dropped in front of everybody during all of this. I was trying to do a, uh, like a, a two outside elbow stall and holding one on the cradle, kind of this really interesting pattern. And I rolled to my other elbow, it dropped, but something crazy happened. I, it dropped once, but I brought my foot out, kicked it up and was able to catch. And I didn't even see it happen. Like it was just sort of, I blacked out for a second and then there it was. And then there was an eruption of applause. Like the air went out of the room and then I got crowned, you know, the victor against Drex as a result of like recovering so well, just with like a kick up. So that's, that's just kind of a story it, of- Yeah, it just blows everybody's minds, right? It's just like, you just blew it out of the water. You're like, whoa, 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 whoa. No, I got this actually. Yeah. And like, you know, it's so good. Sebastian? It could have gone completely the other way. Right. Sebastian had something. Yeah. Yeah, um, kind of picking up there as well. Um, one element I find about a drop so important is that it's the only moment that the audience truly understands what's going on. Like uh, when you when you juggle, they like what they do, they like what they see, but they they feel incompetent. You know, they, I don't know how this is working. You know, they they don't know really. And when you drop, they know how this feels. Like everybody has dropped something, and I think especially sometimes also people people get lucky drops where they drop and then they they catch it again, and they know this feeling as well. And what what you described was like them remembering this feeling that oh one time my bottle dripped and I, I caught it before it spilled water and so I think this is a very strong powerful connection. That's um, yeah like it brings to my mind kind of it's a personal thing for me but um, in terms of different like personas on stage kind of ties into that of I see something very highly produced like um, 
one of Cirque, Cirque du Soleil's Vega shows or something like that versus something more intimate and something much smaller. I find myself more drawn into those more intimate shows. I know that there's the Montreal-based uh, Cette Droite de la Main, a big thing with them, the Seven Fingers, was they were kind of early on pushing, we're going to introduce ourselves to the audience in our stage show. We're going to talk about our personal experiences and things. And you feel that connection more. There's that expectation when you see a big, highly polished Cirque show that it's going to be it's going to be technically huge. It's going to be shiny and amazing, but it's going to be alien. It's going to be in some way distance from a crowd. And for me personally, that idea of that connection. So when you're watching um, the Seven Fingers doing some incredibly difficult acrobatic thing that takes a few attempts because it's they're pushing like a really high level, you don't feel separated when there's a mistake you're drawn in because you want to see them succeed. They've got you on side in a way that if you're completely alien from an audience, there's a thing that you wrote, Dawn, about masks and why masks you feel are cheating. And I so agree because you have that separation. If someone wearing a mask drops, what do I care? That's a, that's a robot that's dropped a thing. I, I'm not invested in that. But if it's someone who's making an honest kind of appeal to an audience, so much more drawn in and I'm so much more likely to follow along. Uh, Robert, uh, are you eating chips or are you wanting to say something? <laughs> I, uh, no, no, I actually wanted to weigh in uh, and I'm eating uh, dried mango pieces. It's mm -hmm. the only thing I have in the house. Um, so kind of like going on what Tom was saying, it is um, the emotional investment of the audience into the performer and like with these big uh these like very big produced shows that you know multiple people can play the same part um you as an audience member want to be wowed like you you're looking for that amazement that like sort of this maybe even like childlike thing but that emotional captivation uh that you can choose that as a performer like how you want to engage and you can say like okay i want to like you know make eye contact with my audience or uh, talk to them and i feel it's a bit easier if you have like a com uh, comedic act but uh you can do this by uh having a very clear emotional expression not just your face but your entire body language and this is something like I've learned in contemporary dance a lot where they sometimes push you so much where you need to, uh, you need to show a certain amount of sadness or that you actually feel sad after training. Like you just go to like, you know, get dressed and go back to normal life. You're like, I feel shit. But the audience feels that too. So if they, they look at that, they feel like a very emotionally loaded uh, piece. And they, of course, could be, if you want something to be like high energy or flashy, it's quite uh, captivating and people will get drawn into like that happiness and excitement. But you can like choose uh, either way. But you don't always have to look into the audience. I think one of the more interesting uh, performances I think I remember like 60 years ago, it was one dancer and it was like a 15, 20 minute thing. And he just like put a chair on the stage and he sat on the chair and it took him 20 minutes. And he lifted his, his hand just like in front of him like that. That was the entire thing, but he did it so convincing and with so much intention that people were still captivated by it. Like capturing that, uh, Emotional captivation. That type of might have been interesting. That that type of performance is so difficult, and I would say, like uh, Blake was talking earlier about, like seeing out and seeing in at the same time. I find that um, performance is kind of like a a meditation that I've learned to share. That like I have to be totally in my meditate, and that's actually what my clown training was sort of doing. Was like, okay, we're going to meditate with our eyes open, and you have to be aware of the room and aware of everything. And in that kind of situation, that person has been able to learn how they feel, 
and learn their own bodies and learn their own um, ways and, and, and be able to share that. That's, uh, that is quite profound um, to be able to do as a performer. I think that is something that I personally try to strive for as a performer. Like, like cry on stage and like scream at a wall with your back towards the audience. Like, it's fine. Like, just do it. Uh, Blake, you're unmuted. Do you have something to say? Yeah, I just, uh, talking about, you know, the placement of the regard is not necessarily entirely inward or just outward in terms of looking directly at the audience. Right. You know, th there's a regard that goes to the horizon that's, that's beyond the audience. There's a regard that goes upstage towards the curtain. And in fact, when the performer looks in that direction, it opens that space for the audience. It gives it meaning. So when you look out to the audience, there, there's a big distinction between looking outward and looking at people specifically within the audience. And that's another thing of sensitivity of seeing who wants to be looked at, who wants to make individual contact with you, or when do I need to just give a sense of outward regard rather than at the ball itself? Because for me, at least in juggling, the first place you want to look is at the ball itself to make sure that it's not falling down. And it takes a little bit more to understand, okay, where am I or how am I expanding the possible spheres of interaction? And I absolutely agree. It's like the, the potential for poetic performance with a ball is something that I don't think I've technically achieved yet. I've tried. But the comedy is always there to kind of ease that tension. Um, and I, I, I wonder about where the ball stands in terms of generating emotional depth for an audience. Does, is there somewhere where that goes beyond purely technical poetic proficiency and style and into a real emotional narrative about a human experience, which the ball is a sort of unnatural experience? So I, I still, I don't have an answer about that. I mean, but. Um, is, there, to... is there any performances actually um, that, that people have seen in contact juggling that have done that for you? Is it, Sebastian? Um, I, I think in a way, if, if I understood right, um, uh, English is, yeah. Um, uh, you know Dimitri Ogen from uh, Flamos? Yes. Yeah, we've got a video of his, yes. a bit of his street show lined up because... Yeah, yeah, but uh, I'm, I'm, not, um, I'm not speaking about like the act, oh, which one is it? Fluid this one says Fluid Druid, so this is old, old, old yeah. work. Yeah, 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 but it, this is, yeah, this is what I was speaking about, like he, um, when he performs live, I've seen him twice as a young child and then later on, and he, um, he makes it happen that he's just there with the object and w the audience is kind of uh, looking at this bubble that he creates, you know, they're not part of the show. Um, sometimes he doesn't even look up and uh, into the audience for like a couple of minutes, but in this time it's, it's kind of a, a pleasure and a privilege to watch what is happening there without having this direct connection with him. And for me, I felt like drifting off into a, a world, which I'm not often doing, um, was very easy with him. Yeah. And y you know something, Dimitri's one of the only uh, contact jugglers. Um, he, like he works with the big troop Flame Oz, but he's one of the only people who can hold a stage of like 500 people. I don't see many contact jugglers. Like a lot of contact jugglers have like intimate mm. uh, 50 to, to 200 people shows, myself included. Mm. But Dimitri captures like his, his energy just goes so far. Um, I agree. Like he's he's uh, got such really special energy as a as a. Judge. Well, you, you can see in there like that street work, but how proficient he is at switching his attention from the prop to the audience and back. And he's got that kind of beatific smile of just being in complete control. This is kind of meditative state, but he's bringing people in. He's not like he's spending the time to draw focus to the, to the prop. But a big thing, and I remember again from, yeah, seeing him uh, busky in Edinburgh, was he takes that time to just make eye contact with someone and then bring them back into the ball. And he's not doing, like, um, lines. He's not uh, doing, like, uh, calls to get money or to get people involved, but he's just involving them with the eye contact and with the posture. Um, and he kept on We saw him doing that act in the pouring Scottish rain 
with his partner holding an umbrella over his head. But the magic was still there because that's just that atmosphere he creates. Like you were saying, Blake, you make that kind of bubble of focus of attention. Like he is the one of the masters of that with contact and just being able to like put you into that world instantly. And yeah, and to be able to do that cycle, like take one ball, go up to four or six and then it's done. Get a hat full of money and then let those crowd move on and then start again. Like so good at that. Yeah, I was never very good at the wizard aesthetic. So I kind of moved past that pretty quickly. And like, I understand how contact lends itself to that, but it was just never really my personality or what gave me energy on stage. And I've seen a lot of wizards and he's probably the best one. He's definitely the fluid druid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think in terms of videos we've got lined up, um, I, do, I think it, it would be criminal for us not to, to mention this one, but other things you can do with a performance. Um, we've got making artistic statements um, and we've got Joseph's um, manipulation for breakfast routine, which again, it was mentioned a couple of weeks ago of coming on stage with the briefcase looking every bit the classic contact juggler performance dressed in black and then doing this and it's incredible it's amazing and, and i do kind of want to say like that's a trope right like uh when i started contact juggling aaron greg made a a, a, a goof video of contact jugglers um, of that trope of like the contact juggler dressed in black on a stage like like the michael motion routine it, the the fluid or sorry the wizards um mind readers like i mean and that's the thing um a lot of people want me to tell their fortune as soon as i come up to them with a ball they're like Ooh, what do i and like I, i'm like i'm not playing that game and so anyway it's 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 um it's interesting because the ball has its own energy and its own um references and 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 people will come up to you and tell you them they'll say to you like oh wow that's uh you look like a, a wizard or an, i've been called an avatar um and a unicorn i don't know but there's that magical <laughs> element that people are like you're clearly a unicorn <laughs> <laughs> and ascribing properties to the ball as well which is super useful for kind of research when they come up to you and go what's that made out of is that made out of water is that made out of whatever it is and that stuff super interesting it's like well these are things i can play with clearly whatever effect i was trying to put over the top of that like it was communicated across um let's just share i wanted to share this one from uh mr roman janine because and if i can't seem to get the time to find the surreal mirror one i was thinking about this after we'd connected um but he, they do a really interesting duet and and that's what's interesting about contact is there's so many um solos out there people who were holding one ball trying to be as big as they can and it's you know, very few people, I mean, I guess Perioko P, um, Mr. Roman Janine were one, was one of the first. This one's so dark. Um, and, and how to bring contact jugglers together on a stage, um, even in different styles and different methods. And uh, these guys share it so lovely, their energy. Yeah, like actual partnership stuff. There's there's people doing really interesting things with it, but it's I mean it's still a niche art, so it's harder to get these people together. But to put that stuff on stage, it's uh, it is still relatively rare, relatively uncommon. Yeah, I was working on a a, a triple um, girl duo thing, I guess um, that we were doing, but in, it's been interrupted by the COVID crisis, unfortunately. So I'm not sure where that's gonna go, but that's so lovely, right? That little moment there. Um, there. Oh, I, I just wanna mention just before it goes out of my head that Jane, your video with Remy is a really good example of that as well. Of the, is it unusual hours? Is that the? Questionable hours. Questionable hours, thank you. Uh, yeah, that's worth, um, finding and watching because again really good is that the bathtub video stuff. bathtub video yeah oh i love that video um did anyone find this real video or no 
I, I could not, which makes okay. me think it's under a different name. Um, yeah. Which is a shame, because yeah, you're right, like uh, mirror partner stuff, but done, which again is a bit of a trope, like um, two people, like doing a duet, there's a, there is a, a trope in dance, in juggling to do a mirror act, but it's a trope because it works, because it is an effective thing to put up there. Um, because again, synchronization is something that really clicks with people as well. If you're talking about kind of shortcuts to make an audience really connect with what they're seeing and something they understand, like you were saying, Sebastian, like the drop is a moment when someone understands. Seeing two people synchronize what they're doing, even if they don't really realize the difficulty of it, they realize that it's difficult to do it at the same time as someone else. So you really get that click moment again. Wasn't it called Au bout de ta balle? The series Ooh. video from a yeah. while ago. Well, I only know it because I actually created a mirror video of contact juggling and then I was like looking at my own video and I found out there was a much better routine um, <laughs> that was out there. It was, it's, it's, um, if anyone can find it, I would really love to share it because it's, um, it is quite well done. Like I'm sure they made it at a circus school or something. And that's part of performance, right, is, is, is training and, and like I, I'm one of those people who went onto the street and just learned through grueling hours in front of people. Um, whereas if I had been trained or I'd gone from school, like I think that's a totally different experience. And also you can start thinking about things like lighting and atmosphere and connections and regard and, and, and um, different elements of performance that, you know, jugglers just don't. But I wish more people in the theater understood the street in terms of holding attention yeah. because in the theater, people take the audience's attention for granted entirely. They got to sit and you sit and watch my thing until it's done. And I'll tell you. And jugglers don't do that because it's like, all right, you better hit your, your spots. And so for me, bringing the street energy even into things that are not juggling related in the theater in terms of just holding energy has been invaluable as a theater maker outside of juggling. And th those two energies balanced with each other of, of craft and consideration of story and space and movement and regard, but also just like that raw, grueling energy of the street, I think is missing sometimes from the theater. And with where we are now, who knows when, where the balance will be between those things in the future. The street might be the only place left to work, so. <laughs> I wanna like j jump onto that um, because Dawn, I know as well, but you guys both do circle shows with contact, right? And I'm I mean, kind I was of wondering. A busker. In, in Edinburgh, I was classified as a busker, yeah. not a circle show. Yeah, so, so in Edinburgh, that's like small ambient semicircles is what I call them sometimes. Semi yeah. Shows. yeah. But basically, but with actual, with more interactivity, with building a crowd in a different way to what ambient affords you ambient being allowing entirely, people to kind of entirely come past. Yeah. I'm kind of wondering how you approach that side of things and how different that is to ambient. How do you build and hold a crowd with contact and how do you finish a show with with uh, with contact? On the mile? Yeah, that kind of show. That kind <laughs> of or if you were to take that, if you were to take that kind of show and do it somewhere that wasn't Edinburgh, do you think you'd be able to to build a crowd I, like that with contact. Can I just take this a, a little bit of a different way for a second and just note the thing that we're watching is it's like, amazing. you yeah. can't, you can't build this. The thing about the, like, like, you know, we can do a how to build a street show at one point in time, but you can't build um, these gorgeous shows on the street because the street requires you to be in a very specific kind of formula in a very specific uh, venue and, and engaging with people in kind of what I call TV audience ways, um, which means like you need to be like wow factor and, and, and catch them. Whereas, I mean, you can do this kind of show on the street. You just won't make any money. You won't make any money and no one will stop or look at you. But They'll like, take videos and then they'll go on their way. Right. But this is gorgeous and it's, it's, um, I mean, because the French government has money and is paying for these types of things to be created, right? And I don't want to show all of this video um, because of uh, copyright, but um, 
we that is in the comments if you want to click or the link is in the comments um, from Robert there. So um, Surreal and Van Kim there can create something that has a, a different approach than the street build, which is a very specific build, right? Blake, do you have a formula yeah. for what that build is? I don't know. I mean, the like I sent the video of my show in Edinburgh, which is Edinburgh only. Let's look I at would, that. I don't really do that show anywhere else because I was adapting to what I thought worked best in that environment. So um, local gear, just insulting Glaswegians to get the Edinburgh people on site. I don't insult any Glaswegians, man. I'm not even working. I don't do. I don't do one, two, three, under trois. I don't. I all this material that I do spoken is my own stupid jokes um but then it's just you know and in this one my crowd is okay but i'm much more vocal in this performance on the street on the mile than i would be in a in a stage show or in a roving gig i think silence accompanies the ball well but silence doesn't always work super well on the street in Edinburgh. I saw a lot of contact jugglers there who were all awesome, uh, taking that kind of Michael Motion approach or wizard approach. And I tried that to some extent, but it just didn't feel right to me. Like I wanted to be more active. I wanted to talk more. I wanted to draw the audience's attention to what I was doing. If I locked into a sequence of tricks, People just thought the ball just flows from one place to another. But then I start to say, now watch this fucking trick. <laughs> I'm going to tell you that this is a hard trick. And I'm sad in this video because I don't hit the jackknife pass, which is disappointing. But of course, you always have to be sad about something. Right. But you see, I give it a couple tries. But so you know, this was but, like four shows in. So oh yeah, no, you get so exhausted. But the Royal Mile is 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 a very specific show, and I'll tell you, I brought Goldie there intentionally fully intention i lasted two days with goldie as a silent act and like i cried oh God, my face can, off yeah. and you i can. took off the paint and i and i went out raw with nothing for the next yeah. 30 days and you can see and like you were talking about the mask like the nose the nose is the smallest mask and unlike other masks it reveals something rather than hiding something and it gives the audience a focal point for my regard and my face in relationship to the ball and gives them a signal like you, I have the stripes on, which has a visual cue, but I'm not in full my makeup. So I'm sort of in between where they're used to things being. And you can see there are people walking by like, unfortunately, this video doesn't show my massive crowd. <laughs> uh, but you see fucking people walking by because there's nowhere to walk by in the street because the street is all blocked by other performers. Let's and be clear, that, that, yeah. that crowd I showed in my first one was an anomaly. <laughs> that was from <laughs> a festival and, and it was very specific. This no, and like, and I've, done shows, I've done sh you do a show in Edinburgh on the street, you're busting your ass and there's five people watching you and no one cares. Another time you go out and suddenly there's 200 people there. And you're like, oh my God, this has got to be huge. Like, I got to hit all my tricks. So everything I did in Edinburgh was much more high energy. But I, I think I've translated that presence, depending on the situation, to other performances. Because you knew that you had to hit the tricks, like, absolutely there. Or else people were going to leave. Because there's someone down the street doing something better than you. Right. Yeah, no, and that's interesting, right? And, and, and I mean, it's just like every other performance. It's like introduction. And I, I just want to mention this because this trick you'll see, I go to the head top of head balance here. And the sun, so rare in Edinburgh, I had to make adjustments for because of my hair catching on fire. Oh, my God. So you see here I go and I put the hat on top of the ball which everyone always loved, but was really just a protection from the sun burning my head. I love I, that. I had to tape a uh, change inside of the hat so it was heavier so it wouldn't be blown off my head by the wind in Edinburgh. <laughs> and then I ball on my head and hat with five in hand and people walking like four inches behind me. And, and that's you just what... keep on rolling. Do you, and do you have a um a little sense for that? Like, do you have to keep your eyes in the back of you, right? 
Yeah, you just, I, I don't know. I mean, it's that grinding. You're mm-hmm. used to anything, you know? Nothing can really phase you in that moment. And if it does, you have to have that sense of recovery. Have you ever, have you ever had anybody harass you or do anything? Oh, like yeah, yeah, yeah. All yeah. the time. I had, you were talking about kids. In Edinburgh, I had a group of like 40 school kids go behind me right when I was setting up to do five with a head balance. And one just pushed me. Oh, I'm sorry to hear saved, that. Saved it. Saved it. Like, they didn't push me that hard. Okay. But earlier, the mention of children, I think in a group is when they really attack. And these are school yes. kids. I have a thing. This is when I will say boo. Like, when, when you know, you get that, because I'm a statue, like, they'll get that all up in your face. Like, oh, look, she can move, blah, 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 blah. And all I have to do is open my eyes and be like, boo. And they, like, lose it. <laughs> like, and then all of their friends, like, because they were the alpha, clearly. And all of their friends are like, oh, she got you. <laughs> it's really brilliant how you can win that back you know so um, yeah no i mean edinburgh is its own special challenge it's distilled everything distilled into one place it's in between a stage and the street because people are there expecting to see performance and what you were saying about street the street being its own form you need to do street things or else you'll have no money and you see people doing things that you're like, I don't really like that, but it works. That's why they're doing it. <laughs> so this is a question I would have is, um, why do we not see contact juggling in Cirque du Soleil? Or like, why are the, like, this is a beautiful thing. And, and, and so, and street performance seems to be our mainstay. Why is there no contact jugglers in these big shows? Because it's small for one. Um, I've seen it presented nicely in, say, in a circus environment like that. And there's like a, a more rounded kind of individual act circus kind of thing presented nice and integrated nicely. Um, Greg says but, Victor Key. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was going to say Victor Key. He's a talk, toss juggler. I mean, when I started contact juggling, I would be like, he's a contact juggler because he can roll, do a chest roll. Is he a contact juggler? Do a chest roll with a Russian ball. That's crazy. <laughs> but you're right. Like it's um, it's not the it's not the standard view of contact. At least it's not the kind of classical view. And I think it's that. Um, I, I think a lot of it does come down to the reason, like you're saying, the reason when you're building a, a circle or that kind of thing, you need to talk is because you need to highlight. You spend so long making this stuff look second nature and effortless but you need to explain to people as well no this is really difficult this is something worthy of your attention worthy of your focus not just because it's uncanny but because it's like technically impressive at the same time i find buddy the ball is like such a great example of that because i can show people like because they see the face and if it lands in the same way they they understand something about the difficulty of that trick and and how to get it so it's like something i can it's cute and stupid so it's like i can have a conversation with it but it's also something that allows me to demonstrate like i'm doing a hard thing and and it's really interesting how we actually have to say that to people or you know the crystal ball is like oh they're gonna drop it a lot of people are like oh she's gonna drop it and that's actually the the power of it is sometimes the danger um but actually they don't understand how difficult it is and they just are like oh yeah that's lovely illusion thing but anyway they move on time's pressing on a bit but that makes me think that idea of like telling people like this thing is special um what i really want to touch on something that we don't really talk about very much i know blake you have kind of opinions about this but the financial side of it So outside of street performance, because that's one aspect that we've talked a lot about, but selling yourself and your act, I know that we're all pretty guilty of underselling ourselves as jugglers, underselling ourselves as contact jugglers. Um, Yeah, like Blake, what, how do you go about selling an act and what are we worth? Oh, you want me to talk about this? I think, yeah, I think you've got experience. Uh, I think what, I, what I wrote in the document that is a principle that was hard earned for me was don't negotiate with yourself and say, well, what am I worth? What, you know, well, what do they want? Say what you need 
and what you think you're worth. And then you can hear from them what they actually have and what they can come back with. I found most clients will defer to you in terms of what the fee is going to be in hopes that you'll undersell yourself. And then they'll say, they'll agree to whatever you said if it's too low. If it's too high, they'll say, we can't pay that, we can give you this. And you'll say, okay, you'll get a number closer to what they think they can give you. That doesn't say haggle every single time, but early on I felt as a performer, well, what, is, what can I really do? How good am I actually? What is it worth? How much can I perform? What are their expectations? Um, and I was overselling myself in terms of how much time I could perform for based on the scale of the event and underselling myself in terms of that charge. Mm. Right now, and this is after a bunch of years, I had nothing under $100 an hour. I, I really won't do unless it's for someone who I know quite well or for some other reason. Um, but in terms of professional engagement, 100 bucks an hour is kind of where I set the bar. Uh, especially because you're, for me, the, the event's not normally going to last longer than maybe four hours average. And, but and that's New York City. Yeah, and that's important to say. Like, I, um, I've actually decided myself, it, uh, I mean, it, they were all canceled for me anyway, but even the lives, like, I'm not going to perform for a little while because, like, you can grind yourself into the pavement by trying to be like, I'm going to nickel and dime and catch every, every client that passes me by. Um, but inevitably I need to, like I could do that when I was younger. Um, inevitably I need to make sure that I'm making what I'm worth and, and what I actually have to pay for rent or my living expenses. Um, and if someone's actually willing to offer me what I'm worth, <laughs> then I will actually perform for them. Um, but otherwise I'm gonna actually take a step back. And people are mentioning in the comments the size of the event that you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. How much money is on the table for them? They're gonna try to make money off of you. That is no question. The person who's running the event and hiring you is trying to make a profit off of you. You yes. know, you don't want to get political, but labor theory of value. So you need to understand, and especially with contact juggling, like if they want you, they want you. It's a pretty specialized skill. If you're competing with someone for that job, you probably know who they are. <laughs> You know? <laughs> we're all in like in the same yeah. pool of people and you're right? gonna be like there's some mystery contact juggler who showed up out of nowhere and started stealing gigs from me no we're not suited for every single gig you know it's a it's a certain kind of gig that people want us for it's not every single one mm -hmm. you know i have people who dress up like mickey mouse and they want them every single weekend for a birthday party so you're not going to get that much money yeah but when we come in you know they're doing their for me, like their French mime birthday party or their circus themed business, this and that. And they want this thing. Yeah. And the client had a video or knows you and said, this is the person. You know those people with the crystal ball? Yes, this is the person. So don't undersell yourself because you have a highly specialized skill. And if you want to talk about how much per hour, make sure you take into account the hours of practice and the hours of preparation for whatever they expect you to do in the gig. Whether it's a stage show, whether it's a certain kind of costume, whether it's a new timing, whether it's a big gig or a stage show or a small gig, that's gonna take preparation every single time. It's never gonna be the same. No. And just like check the box. Everyone's gonna have something different. And so you need to understand that your unique skill is worth something and you shouldn't, use how you feel about how good you are juggling to judge how other people feel about it or how much other people are willing to pay for it. But then you need to deliver. And that's another question. Delivery is an important factor. Sebastian. Yeah. Um, if, if there's uh, like a follow-up event and, and, and something like this is about like the, how to calculate a show and this kind of things. So I, I work with an NGO in Austria who helps young artists to evaluate what they do. So I have some experience in, in this process of finding this out. Um, I want to throw just one thought in, like uh, two thoughts. So the one thought is think how many jobs you missed out because you were off, uh, asking for too little money. Like if it's a big company, 
they they have a budget for the show. Yes, they will earn their cut, they will make a lot of money, but there's a budget for the show. And if you're under it, they cannot take you because they deal in numbers. This is not worth enough for them. It's nothing to do with what you do. Um, so you have to like go really high and leave yourself some leeway how you can negotiate into more money. And the second thought is just like, um, whatever your price is, and you go there and you do this show, people will see what you do. They will like it. They will find out the price and they will offer you kind of the same price again. Um, so if you do $300 jobs, you will get more $300 jobs. If you do $800 jobs, you get less, but you get more and more $800 jobs. So you build up. But yeah, there is a, a lot of thought to this and maybe it's too much for now. Yeah, and if I have a person, a client who's offered me a lot of money before and then says, I have to offer you less money because of this, because it's a big gig, because it might lead to something in the future, and I trust that person to have delivered money in the past, I might be, okay, I'll take less money. But if it's less money every single time they offer, and every time there's an excuse or something for exposure, you start to maybe not want to work with that person anymore. So, you know, you have to adjust on a, on a gig to gig basis. And for me, it depends on the trust of the person who's offering me that gig and what I've done with them in the past. You don't want all that nourishing, sustaining exposure. It just keeps, a, keeps the artist living and, and going. Nom, 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 nom. <laughs> I mean, people die of exposure. <laughs> Literally. Yeah, artists, good, good, good. I think a lot of artists are on the verge. <laughs> <laughs> that's a terrible thing to say so let's uh bring that up a little bit at the end of here we're almost at an hour and a half so we have to wrap this video part of the fun contact juggling seminars up into a nice tight circle um next week we have on the table uh sebastian and mcp will be talking about anything not ball contact um that is anything that any other props, uh, staff and all the, yeah, sure. <laughs> Water bottles, whatever you like to uh, put contact juggling theory onto yeah, other props and how that happened and where that's going to go and how that's been. Um, yeah, some of the cross pollination that's been happening. I got distracted by the comments, but yeah, exactly. The cross pollination <laughs> that was happening. Um, anything else happening, Tom? Um, we are in the the planning stages of getting a watch party for in isolation on the go um, and we're thinking of doing a Saturday um, maybe starting slightly later than now but around about this time but on a Saturday um, and what I'll probably do because there's a few bits of in isolation that are up and we'll get people to watch along with that and Drew's up for it and we'll get other people involved but maybe get some other like big, good contact videos. And um, I'll probably get a thing going on Facebook where you, if you've got a video you want to share with everyone and say, this is really cool and everyone should watch it. And then we can geek out about why it's good and all the nice stuff that's going on. Um, so yeah, at the moment plan is for Saturday. So we'll still have this on Sunday, talking about mixed props and how they've taken contact and how we've taken stuff back. And Saturday we'll do a watch party within isolation and hopefully some other stuff. Yeah, yes. at least all the pieces well. that are allowed to be online. Um, yeah, sorry about all the confusion this week. That was because of this conversation that Tom and I were having. Uh, but we will try and keep uh, three o'clock, um, like this time, yes, Eastern Daylight Time, uh, on Sundays from now on to just keep it consistent because uh, it helps with the confusion. Yeah. And this the thing is, if we can get enough videos lined up and we can keep the watch party going, we can get our other time zones involved as well so greg Just is asking that's morning. next saturday for sure yes 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 yeah we'll uh, we'll nail that down and say next saturday we'll yeah. have you watching times and i believe we're trying to get drew involved and stuff like that so we'll see yeah. if it works and that's going to be it um otherwise uh same bad time same bad channel next sunday and as long as the covid crisis is happening and we don't totally burn out from mental health problems which <laughs> Just a shout out there, if anybody's having them, that's pretty normal right now. <laughs> so um, I hope that you guys are all taking care of yourself and I'm going to end this video, but you can continue to chat here um, after this is done. 
say all of your politically incorrect things. Thank you very much for Thank you, everybody. joining us. And we'll see you next time. See you next time. Thank you. Yay.